All right, now, would you stand and join me in the reading of God's Word? There's two different portions of Scripture. I hope you have your Bible because you will go back and forth between the two in our time remaining. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, and then Romans chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, and then 22 through 23. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when, turn to your neighbor and say, but when. The fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law that, so that we might receive adoption. Turn to your other neighbor and say, adoption. adoption. As sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Romans 6, verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Verse 22, but now, say but now, but now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You can have a seat. This past week I got to spend some time and one of my favorite places in the world, in the city of Chennai in South India, there is a cave known as St. Thomas Mount. It is the cave of the Apostle Thomas. When he landed in India, he made his way up to this particular region. On a hill, there is a cave. In this cave, he lived, he ate, he made disciples, and he prayed. It's hard to explain to you the feeling one gets when they are in this cave, knowing that the person who lived here was one who knew Jesus and followed Jesus and loved Jesus and believed that he was to give his life to Jesus and leave everything he knew to come to a place he did not know in order to let others see the beauty and the wonder of Jesus. As I was in the cave, what typically happens to me is I begin to feel a burning in my heart, the renewal of the passion of God to know God and to make God known. And as always, as I am in this cave, I begin to think about the many people who have died because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. I think of the many martyrs in history who have given their lives. I think of people today who are giving their lives to follow Jesus, people who, who do not have the, the same ability we have to gather in a space like this, to publicly confess their faith before the world, streaming online for the world to know. They gather in secrecy. They gather under the threat of punishment and of death. It was Tertullian who said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. In this cave, I, I think about the song that I love and that we have sung so many times, a song that many of you know I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. That song that was recorded lyrically by Sundar Singh was not written by him. Rather, it was the final words of a man who gave his life to follow Jesus in a small village in North India. A missionary descended upon this village and began to preach the good news of Jesus. This man, his wife, his children gave their life to the Lord Jesus. It did not sit well in this Hindu village with the Hindu chiefs. And so they brought this family before the chiefs and before the people and they said, you must recant, otherwise we'll kill you. And the words of this man was, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. They said, if you do not recant, we will kill your wife in front of you. Though none go with me, still I will follow. They kill his wife in front of him. 
If you not recant, we will kill your children in front of you. They wouldn't recant. They killed his children. If you do not recant, we will kill you. The cross before me, the world behind me. And they kill him. Eventually, through his faith, many in the village came to know Jesus. But as I sat there in this cave, I must admit to you the question I did not have was, could I die for Jesus? The question I have and the question I have for you is, can I live for him? Can we live for Jesus? What I want to show you very quickly in our text today is a simple word to encourage you, which is this. Jesus is the sufficiency our hearts long for. Jesus is the one that from the moment of your conception, from the moment you took your first breath, what your soul, what your heart was longing for was to find its deepest satisfaction in its creator, to find in the life of Jesus the all-sufficient savior. People around the world have been asking about this movement that's happening at Asbury University, this small Christian liberal arts university in Wilmington, Kentucky. Even in India, people are asking me, what do you think about what's happening in Asbury? Do you believe in the revival? Have you gone to see the revival in person? And I told them, listen, I have four kids. While there's revival, my wife and I are just barely holding on, looking for survival. But it seems real. It seems as though the Spirit of God is moving and awakening something in this generation. But the question for us is not, is that a revival based on what's happening there? The test of whether or not it's a revival of the Spirit of God is what happens when they leave. Will they continue to walk in holy devotion and obedience to Jesus? Because what happened in the upper room when the 120 gathered and the Spirit of God fell, spilled out into the streets. And when they walk in obedience, and we pray that they do, and when we walk in obedience and we pray that we do, what you will quickly discover is that the Christian life is full of tensions. Can I get an amen from somebody who feels the tension of the Christian life? A few weeks ago, I'm flying to Dallas. I am 40,000 feet in the air. When I am flying, I like to talk to nobody. I like my hoodie up. I like my music on, and I have a Bible in my hands. And so there I am reading my Bible. There happens to be a gentleman next to me, head to toe, dressed in cowboy attire. My brother next to him, as I am reading the Bible, he looks at me, taps me on the shoulder, and he says, reading the Bible, eh? (laughs) And I wasn't sure if it was a question or a statement. It felt like that moment in Dumb and Dumber where Jim Carrey comes out and says, big gulp, say, just sort of just putting it out there. Reading the Bible, eh? And in the moment, what I wanted to say was, in the words of the immortal Blackstreet, no diggity, no doubt. But based on uh, the particular attire he was wearing, I did not think he would understand my mid-90s R&B reference. So I simply said, yes. And he looks at me and he goes, Hebrews 11.1. And he starts tapping my Bible. Oh, you want me to turn to Hebrews 11.1? So I turn to Hebrews 11.1. Now faith is the evidence of things unseen. John 13.6. And I said, do you mean John 14.6? Because John 13.6 is just Peter wondering why Jesus is washing his feet. He's like, no, it's John 13.6. So we go to John 13.6. Maybe John 14.6. Okay, so we go to John (laughs) 14.6. And he says, Exodus 33. We go to Exodus 33. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself two things. One, I'm thinking... These are the moments my brother is most useful, talking to strangers on flights. Why is he not doing anything? I'm trying to get his attention. That's my brother's favorite verse, you know. And my brother just gives me a, like, no, I need you in this conversation right now. That's the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed is whenever you begin to look at the scriptures, even the ones he pointed out, you begin to see how much tension is in those particular verses. See, this book, this book which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, this book which is inerrant, which means truthful, from cover to cover, truthful, this book which is authoritative in your life, it cuts through bone and marrow, cuts through the hardest of hearts. See, the older I get, I'm more and more convinced that the reason we don't read our Bibles is not because we don't have time, is not because we're too busy. It's not because we don't understand it. It's because it's easier, friends, to live in the comfort of religion than to live under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. See, it's a lot harder to not love your wife as Christ loved the church as long as you don't read Ephesians 5. 
It's much easier to live your life using your sexuality as, as however you please, as long as you don't live in Romans 8. But this scripture, it cuts you to the very heart. It reveals some things about you. And then what it does is it presents you with a life full of tensions. Jesus, on the one hand, he says, I want you to be in the world, but don't be of it. Anyone feel that tension? I want you to die to yourself in order that you might live for God. Anyone feel that tension? Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But then how come every time I have dairy, it seems to prosper and be a weapon against me? How do I live in this tension? See, a lot of times Christians will say, a pastor, how do I balance my life? How do I balance having children and career and marriage and singleness and new neighborhoods and new desires and pain and suffering and sickness and parents? How do I live a balanced life? And the answer is, you can't. There is no such thing as balance. None. Life is living in tension. The tension of life and discipleship to Jesus, following the way of Jesus, living the way of the kingdom is full of tension. On the one hand, the scriptures say that by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, we are free from sin. Yet we must daily yield to the working of the Holy Spirit in us so that we don't yield to the power of sin. We are told that we have been given peace by God, yet we are to strive for peace. We are told to be a people of justice, and yet we are told to pray for those who have been unjust towards us. How do we live this life of tension? Should we live this life of tension? What I would call these, and what we're calling this in our series, is sacred tensions. The tensions of the Christian Story And the reason that we are in these tensions is because, friends, we are in what many theologians would call living in the land in between. When Jesus arrived on the scene, he begins to preach the gospel of the good news of the kingdom of God, the arrival of his kingdom. The good news, according to Jesus, was not when you die, if you believe me, you get to go to heaven. The good news of Jesus was that in and through him, the long-awaited kingdom of God has arrived. And every other kingdom is subject to that kingdom. And we now live in a kingdom that was inaugurated by God but we have not lived in the full realization of that kingdom, which is still coming. At the return of Christ and the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no tension. But for now, we have this tension and we need this tension because you grow in tension. You are shaped in tension. You are formed in tension. You are transformed in tension as you live in dependence to Jesus. And Galatians 4 and Romans 6 is an invitation into that tension. The other day, my son was telling me we were at a parent-teacher conference. And he said, Dad, would you mind if, and he gave me uh, an occupation he wanted. Now, what I love about my son, who's 12 years old, is one, he is so much more like Jesus in ways I only pray I could be. He is kind and he is empathetic. He is understanding. He is present with people. And if you ask him a question, he is very honest. I even asked my son, son, how can I be more like Jesus? Parents, you want an act of humility? Ask your children how you could be more like Jesus. And here's what I love about children. They don't know that according to a Harvard business study, for every one critique, you need six positives. There's no positive. They just tell you the critique. And so in that moment, you can live deeper in humility or ground them for a month. It's really your call. So I ask him how I can be more like Jesus. He tells me, but in this particular conversation, he said, dad, do you care if I do this occupation? I said, no, I think that's a great occupation. You should go for it. Then he goes, dad, I want to devote my life to it. So I try to pull back a little bit and say, well, son, as followers of Jesus, we want to devote our lives to Jesus. And wherever Jesus leads us, Walk in obedience to that calling. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, whether you eat, sleep, or drink, do all for the glory of God. Now, what he's doing and what I love about him at 12, he has the courage to admit that he wants to devote his life to something. We don't have that same courage. 
We love to play the Christian card. I'm devoted to Jesus. I'm devoted to the things of God, where deep down, we are devoted to other things and other people. At least he has the courage to admit it. And what Galatians 4 and Romans 6 is doing is calling you back to devote your life to the only one who can give you the sufficiency your soul is longing for. In fact, I would say that between Galatians 4 and Romans 6, we find the central tension of the Christian story. Look at both of these put together. On the one hand, Galatians 4 says that you are no longer slaves. Praise God. Anyone here feel like they are no longer a slave? You are a child of the living God. Anyone here today that you know this is true of you? You are a child of the living God. Galatians 4 verse 7. But if you look at Romans 6.22, it says but you are a slave to God. Well, Paul, who wrote Galatians and Romans, which one am I? Am I a child of the living God, no longer a slave, or am I a slave to God? Which one? And the answer is both. Anyone feel the tension? Which means that we are free, yet forever enslaved. But the question, according to Romans 6, is not, are you a child or a slave, but to whom are you a child and a slave? In this day and age, when they would use the word child, it meant identity. From whom do you get your identity? A child would get their identity in the ancient Near East from their father. Whoever their father was, was about their future, their security, their career, their ambition, their desires, all came from their father. Whoever you obeyed, you were a slave to. So Paul says in Romans 6, whoever you obey, you are a slave to that thing or to that person. So the question is not, am I a child or am I a slave? The question is, from whom do I get my identity and to whom do I give my devotion? And the easiest way to find out what this is, is two ways. Number one, some of the easiest ways you can find out if you are enslaved to something is to see how you respond when that thing is taken away. When that relationship is taken away, when the money is taken away, when the career is taken away, when the friendship is taken away, when the house is taken away, when the dream is taken away, how do I respond? Or you can tell who you are enslaved to by who you're becoming. Jesus says a student is never over his master which means however the master lives, the fruit of the master is produced in the student. Now tell me, are you a student of Jesus or a student of the Republican Party, a student of the Democratic Party, a student of Black Lives Matter, a student of Blue Lives Matter, a student of the new gender ideology of 2023, a student of the new sexuality identity of 2023? Who are you a student of the American dream that tells you that life is about having a nice house in the suburbs with a nice picket fence and a walk-in closet at two and a half kids. Is that who you are student of? Who are you becoming? And the fruit of who you are becoming, it will tell you to whom your life is devoted to. And unless, unless you and I are willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus, unless we are willing to submit to the work of the Holy Spirit, you and I will forever be enslaved to things that always overpromise and underdeliver. It always wants more of you. Here's the thing about sin. Sin can never get enough of you. It always wants more, takes you further, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. It'll lead you into more guilt, into more shame, and into more brokenness. It will always go that direction, always promising to satisfy, and it might for a moment, until it needs more. It needs more of you. It always does this. What are we enslaved to? And unless we are willing to acknowledge that we must submit our lives to the Holy Spirit and walk in the tension of what it means to be a child and a slave of God, you will never experience the fullness, the beauty, the joy, the strength, the power, the transcendence, the transformative Christian life. And you will forever vacillate between masters. I'll vacillate between God is my master, sex is my master. Jesus is my master, money is my master. Jesus is my master, my children 
are my master. I devote my life to my children. I devote my life to my spouse. I devote my life to career. I devote my life to money. I devote my life to all the things that never satisfy. This is what our hearts are constantly seduced by, a master. But the cross of Jesus has come to lead us and bring us into a new identity and to give us a new devotion. The cross of Jesus, the reason why Paul says, I boast in the cross of Christ and want to know nothing, I don't want to know anything other than the cross of Jesus, is not because the cross now frees you to live your American, autonomous, postmodern, enlightened lives. The cross of Jesus awakens your imagination to what it is to live life with God. The cross of Jesus extends to you the invitation of what it means to live in the sufficiency of Christ, to find in him the absolute of absolutes. And in a world of wandering truths and fleeting moments, Jesus is the absolute of absolutes. He is God's total answer to your total need. So how do we live in this tension of being a child of God and yet being a slave of God? How do we live in this tension? Who is Paul speaking to? In Romans and Galatians, Paul is speaking to followers of Jesus in the church who find themselves struggling and might even consider wandering from Jesus. Where do they find themselves? They find themselves living under the most powerful religious institution man has ever known. The kind of institution that says if you perform these laws, if you live this particular way, if you do these things, then you will be saved. You will find yourself good with God and made right with God. Sounds a lot like 2023. They are living in the most powerful empire the world has ever known, which banks all of its strength on its economic power, its political power, and it's military power. That as long as the Roman Empire exists, you will be safe. You will have a future. You will have a life. It sounds a lot like 2023. They are living in a season of life, in a, in a moment of life where Greek philosophy is finding itself in the lives of daily people, but even in the church, the kind of philosophy that says that you above all are God. Live for the self, live for your fleeting moments. Whatever you feel, do it. Sounds a lot like 2023. And in the midst of this, Paul is saying, if you want to live the life that God has called you to live in this tension that will shape and form you, you must recognize every morning from the time that your feet hit the floor that there is an invitation being extended to you that someone is coming to gain mastery over you. Someone is begging you to be their slave. Your heart does it, the culture does it, the world does it, even religion can do it. It is calling your name. And at the same time, God is extending an invitation to you to be once more his child, to devote your life to following him. And the invitation you choose will determine the reality you experience. Which will you choose each and every day? Day. So how do we live in this tension? Let me just unpack this in our time remaining. How do we live in this tension? The first is to recognize the false master. There is a false master who is constantly whispering in your ear for you to find your identity in it and to devote your life to it. Paul would call this the elementary principles of the world. He says in Galatians 4, do not be enslaved once more to the elementary principles of this world. What are the elementary principles of the world? You could categorize this in three things. One, it is the Mosaic law, the law given by God that people now look to to be their master and to save them. The second thing would be the pagan religions of the day. If you follow these religions, they will save you and heal you of your brokenness or it's complete law lawlessness. Do whatever you want, however you want, with whomever you want, and you will find the freedom you are looking for. All of these, Paul calls elementary principles of the world. And if we follow these principles, Paul calls us 
children. This is not a derogatory term that Paul is using. By using the word child, Paul is going back and comparing us to what happens in in families in the ancient Near East. The word child means minor child. To be a minor child in the ancient Near East meant that you had no rights and no inheritance. And your inheritance was a big deal. Your inheritance is where you had the security for your future, your occupation, your identity, all of it. As long as you were a minor, you had none of this. Rather, you were treated as a slave. Now, what does he mean by slave? He is not speaking to what we would call shadow slavery, which is the slavery that happened in the history of the United States, the kidnapping, rape, violence. That is not what Paul is speaking of. That the the scriptures clearly condemn. He's using the word bondservant. Essentially, you live in the home, you work for the master, but you are never a child. You are never treated as a child. You just perpetually work for the master. And while you are a slave, while a child is treated as a slave, they are put under a guardian. The guardian raises the child. At a certain point, when the appointed time comes, the father says, ah, today you are my son and raises them up as a son and gives them the rights to the inheritance. Likewise, you and I, apart from Jesus, have been given the law as a guardian. The Ten Commandments and all of the law of the Old Testament were given to us as a guardian. Now keep in mind, the law is good. Anything that God gives is good. However, the law was distorted by the people. The law was never meant to save you. The law was never meant to save us. The law was never the standard. If the law was the standard, all you have to do was obey the 10 commandments and then you're saved. The law was not the standard, Jesus is the standard. The law was meant to point to the fact that you are slaves. You are slaves to murderous thoughts. You are slaves to thieving. You are slaves to insults. You are slaves to the things of this world. And it points to the fact that you need a savior. Think of the law as an x-ray. An x-ray can show you that your bone is broken, but the x-ray can't fix you at all. It points to the fact that you need a savior. Paul is saying that the law points to the fact that you need a savior because you are enslaved to religion. You are enslaved to pagan idolatry. You are enslaved to the things of this world called sin, which promise to save you, but they cannot save you. They have gained mastery over you. But when? The Bible is full of buts. This might be my favorite. I like, being, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I haven't slept in 36 hours. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But when, but when the fullness of time had come, when God had enough, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman, born under the law to what? To redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Paul is using a powerful word by the word adoption. When a father adopted a child, the father was legally bound to keep that child forever, giving that child the inheritance forever. No matter what the kid did, no matter how they acted, no matter whatever they did, they were inside of this family forever. That is what God does when you become his child. But Paul is also saying something very, very, very important for us in 2023 to correct our wrong theology. See, we believe that everyone from the moment they are born are a child of God. And we hear this over and over and over again. We preach these sermons. These go viral on Instagram and viral on TikTok. No matter what you've done, no matter how you've acted, no matter your past, no matter your brokenness, you are a child of God. That is actually not true. You are only a child of God if you are in fact a child of God. According to the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12, only those who believe in Jesus and not believe in him that he existed, even the demons believe he existed, but you believe in Jesus as the savior of your life, the one who paid for the penalty of your sins, because according to Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. For only those who believe in the resurrection of Jesus, they have the right to be called children of God. 
Apart from that, we are not children of God. We are children of wrath, conceived in iniquity, destined for his wrath, destined for a life apart from him. But God, even when we push God, even when you reject God, even when you want nothing to do with God, he still loves you. He loves you enough to bring his enemy, not to become a stranger in his house, but to become a child. You now get to become a son and daughter of the most high God. And because you are now a child of the most high God, it means you are no longer a slave to religion. You are no longer a slave to performance. You are no longer a slave to your past. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are adopted as his child and you now are invited to live in the presence of Jesus and the father who loves you. So not only do we recognize the false master, that's only step one. But step two then is to remember the better master. Paul says in Romans 6, 15, what then are we free now to sin however we want because we're free. Grace is not the license to sin. We are not free to sin. Friends, we are free not to sin. We are free to no longer manipulate others for our own gain. We are free to no longer to try to control every situation. We are free to no longer live in the anchor or anchoring ourselves in the anger of things that control us. We are free to live as his children, but we are free to live as slaves to God, servants to God. What does Paul mean by the word slave? He's using the word bondservant, doulos. It's the, that's the word he's using. When there was a servant in a home, when it came time for that servant to be set free, the servant could say, I want to remain with my master. And why do they want to remain with their master? Because they love their master. And what they would do is they would go to the doorpost of their master and they would get their ear nailed into the door for a few moments, which is what I'm thinking I'm gonna start doing whenever we hire staff at the church. You get your ear nailed on the door just to see if you're really bought in or not. And you, beget, you become a doulos because you are not compelled by religion. You're not afraid of what the master might do. You love the master because the master treats you with dignity. The master always comes through on his promises. The master raises you up as a child. You love this master and you want to devote your life to him. King Solomon in the Old Testament, when he finishes the temple of God and before the presence of God enters into the temple, he says this prayer for the people of God. And he ends the prayer by giving them a challenge and saying, devote your life to Yahweh. Give your life to Yahweh. Walk in his statutes. Keep all of his commandments. But the story of the people of God is that time and time and time again, they find lesser gods to worship, continually enslaved to lesser gods. It was John Calvin who says that our hearts are idol factories. We take what God has created, we make them idols that we worship, believing that maybe these things will save us. C.S. Lewis, he calls us half-hearted creatures, that we are floundering around in this life. We are too easily pleased, C.S. Lewis says. Because most of us would love to believe, oh, I, I, don't, I don't have any masters. I don't have any masters. I, I'm a free wandering soul. I don't owe my life to anyone. I don't devote my life to anyone. Yet how easily we settle for money. We settle for pornography when real intimacy is available with Christ. We settle for career, we settle for 401k, we, we settle for fame and comfort, we even settle for ministry. Perhaps ministry is what will save me. Years ago, I was in college, I was sitting at a church service and the pastor ended the service, said, we're gonna do something special today. We're all gonna take off our shoes and we're gonna bring them to the altar. We're gonna give them away to the homeless. And I looked down and I was wearing Air Force Ones. And I thought to myself, it's a true story. I don't think the homeless would appreciate the value of these shoes. <laughs> so I left. Now let me ask you a question. 
Did I have Air Force Ones or did Air Force Ones have me? Let me ask you, do you have money or does money have you? Do you have children or do children have you? Do you have a fiance or does your fiance have you? Do you have sex and sexuality and gender identity and career ambitions? Do you have trauma or does your trauma have you? One of the saddest things about Christians in 2023 is that they believe that they can never be healed of their trauma, that this is somehow their identity. And as long as they hold on to this, they'll belong, they'll be someone, they'll be welcomed and invited, never believing or trusting that they could be healed of all of this. They are enslaved to this master. But there's a better master. There's a better master. A master who doesn't speak to you from a distance, but a master who enters your story, who enters the human story to live the life you are destined to live, to die the death you were meant to die, to rescue you from every master who has enslaved you, to give himself to you that you could be attached to him. Friends, the gospel did not come to modify the way you behave. The gospel came to restore you, my brothers today, as sons. The gospel came, my sisters, to restore you as daughters, to no longer have to live in the weight of what culture says about you, but to live in the presence of the Father who loves you and to give you a new master a master who loves you, a master who is for you and not against you, a master who gives and extends his kindness to you. So we live in this tension because we are free and yet forever enslaved, but now we are enslaved and we are servants to all that is good and all that is holy and all that is beautiful and all that is kind and all that is true. We join with Thomas who looked at the master and said, come, let us go with the master that we might die with him. He found a better master. What this means for us today is we wake up in the morning and we go to God and we say, God, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how to forgive this person who has betrayed me so deeply. I don't understand what I'm supposed to do with the longing in my soul to be with someone. I don't understand how to walk in obedience with the resources you've given me. I don't understand how to live a life holy and pure, but I trust you. I trust you, so I'll obey because I'll find in you everything my soul longs for. I'll find in you the sufficiency of my life. And the question you have to ask if you're a follower of Jesus, and if you are not a follower of Jesus, you have got to ask this question. How, how could one man, how could one man satisfy every human soul? How could one man bring the deepest joy of life to every human who has existed? How could one man be the sufficiency of all of our hearts because that one man is worth more than everything? If you take, if you take from the smallest of anthills to the snow-capped mountain of the Rockies, if you take every moment of joy and pleasure in this world, if you take the smallest of particles to every star and planet in the galaxy, if you take every sunrise and every sunset and every moment of laughter and happiness and you put them all on a scale, Jesus would still be worth more. He would still be heavier. So I give, you give, we live in this tension of being his child and being his servant to give Jesus our highest devotion because he is our greatest prize. He is of infinite value because we have been baptized in his love, in his life, in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We give our devotion to him and him alone.
as a child and as a servant. So there in the cave, there's a boulder. And I kneel down and I put my forearms into a particular place. Legend has it that St. Thomas, he prayed so hard that his forearms were embedded into the rock. And so I, I prayed there and I began to think of my grandfather, who is my father's hero. I never met my grandfather. He died when my dad was 12. But the story of my grandfather is that he was raised in a Hindu family. His father died when he was a child, which meant, which meant all of the inheritance would go to my grandfather. But at the age of 15, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus. And his uncles, who were his guardians, said, if you give your life to Jesus, you will lose everything. The land that was in his name, you would lose the land. There was a girl from his childhood that they grew up together knowing that they would be married. You lose your wife. You lose everything. And it translates better in Tamil, but he said, Mannavanda, Ponnavanda, Wannavanda. I don't want the land. I don't want the wife. I don't want anything. I only want Jesus. Because he found in Jesus what St. Francis of Assisi would call my God and my all. So friends, right here, right now, this moment in time, this second in time, the Spirit of God is moving and asking you, are you free or are you a slave? Are you a child of the culture or are you a son, a daughter of the Most High God? And the invitation to you is extended and the invitation you choose will determine what you experience. So we did this sermon early this Sunday. In a moment, you're gonna see, a bapt you're gonna see tons of baptisms. If the Spirit of God is working in you to be baptized, this is something you need to do. But here now in this moment, I wanna ask as the worship team is singing, they're gonna lead us in a time of extended worship. The prayer team is gonna be up. I'm gonna ask, is there somewhere in your life where you know I'm enslaved and I need freedom. I'm not living as a son and daughter. I am not devoting my life to Jesus. And in this time of worship, these next 15 or so minutes, would you just give Jesus your absolute best worship? Stop caring what people think around you. Just stop. Just stop caring what people around you think. Last time I checked, they didn't die on the cross for you. Neither did I. Just stop caring. I mean, for once in your life, just stop caring what people think about you and just worry about how much Jesus loves you and give him your devotion. If you wanna come up to the front and pray, come pray. If you wanna come up and kneel, come kneel. Whatever the Spirit of God is leading you to do, come and come now as we pray. Stand up, let me pray for us and let's sing together. Father, in this moment, we ask that the Spirit of God will fall. Come on, if you want the Spirit of God to fall in this place, open up your hands. Spirit of the living God, would you come? Would you usher us into the throne room of God? Would you bring us into the presence of the Father? Come on, if that's you, would you invite the presence of the God, God here in this place? Spirit of the living God, draw us to be your children. Draw us to walk in healing. Draw us to, be, to live in your holiness forever. God, bring us here in this place that we would be forever changed. Come on, cry out to God right now. Begin to invite the Spirit of God to work in you. God, call us to be your sons. Call us to be your daughters, no longer enslaved to this world, but to live as sons and as daughters of the Most High God to the praise and glory of his name. All of God's people said, amen and amen.